Welcome to a virtual version of the Lord's Day service for November 6th, 2022. I'll start by reading some scripture. And we have a reading from Haggai. He's a minor prophet um, in one of the 12 minor prophets. And uh, hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Now, in the second year of King Darius, in the seventh month, on the 21st day of that month, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai, saying, Speak now to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtai, governor of Judah, and the Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the remnant of the people, and say, Who is left among you that saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Is it not in your sight as nothing? Yet take courage, O Zerubbabel, says the Lord. Take courage, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Take courage, all you people of the land, says the Lord. Work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts, according to the promise that I made when you came out of Egypt. My spirit abides among you. Do not fear, for thus says the Lord of hosts once again, uh, in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all the nations so that the treasure of all nations shall come. I will fill this house with splendor, says the Lord of hosts. Silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The latter splendor of this house will be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts, in this place that I will give prosperity. Our next reading is from Psalms. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. This is Psalms 98. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained him victory. The Lord has made known his victory. He has revealed his vindication in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have, uh, ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth in joyous songs and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with a lyre, with a lyre and the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let us see, let the sea roar and all that fills it, and the world and all who live in it. Let the floods clap their hands. Let the hills sing for, together for joy at the presence of the Lord, for he is co coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the people with equity. And our final reading today is from 2 Thessalonians. Hear what the Spirit saying to the church. As to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we beg you, brothers and sisters, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as though from us to a, the effect of the day of the Lord is already here. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the lawless one is revealed, the one destined for destruction. He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, declaring himself to be God. Do, not, do you not remember that I told you these things while I was still with you? We must always give thanks to, to, to God for you, brothers and sisters, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as first fruits for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and through belief in the truth. For this purpose, he called you to through our proclamation of the good news, so that he, you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brothers and sisters, stand firm, hold fast to the traditions that you were taught, either by word of mouth or by our letter. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and through the grace given us the eternal comfort and good hope, comfort your hearts and strengthen them in every good work for the Lord. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, it was time to go home. And the exiles had been in Babylon 
for 50 years. And there was a change in leadership. King Nebuchadnezzar was long gone and uh, he was con conquered by the Persians. Now we hear about King Cyrus. Uh, King Cyrus was the one that, uh, that conquered Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. And Cyrus said, you know, enough already. Let's just send those Judean exiles back to Jerusalem to rebuild what they destroyed. Now, uh, in this week's service, there'll be a map in the bulletin, and it will show how the uh, people that were exiled from Jerusalem, which is on the west side or the east of the map, and they were taken to Babylon, which is now present-day Iraq, um, in 587 BCE, around that time. And then these were the elites of of. Uh, uh, of Jerusalem. These were the elites of the Judeans of that time. They were taken. A lot of people were left behind, but the elites, the top leadership were taken there, and they then were released by King Cyrus and sent back to Jerusalem in 537 BCE, so about 50 years later. And that is a long way that uh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem to Babylon is about four to 500 miles. And that 50 years is at least two generations. So you can see, and you know, if you know people who are immigrants, you know, within a generation or two, they've become quite assimilated into the new culture. But we read about how they were returned to Jerusalem. And the main leader, uh, is a guy named Zerubbabel. And we read about this in the book of Ezra. Now, Zerubbabel is kind of a cool name. I really like it. But um, our reading today is actually from the prophet who is uh, telling Zerubbabel the God, the, about God's command and God's command to rebuild the temple. And by this time, it's about 15 years after they returned uh, from Babylon to Jerusalem. It was time to build the temple. Cyrus was long gone. There were actually a couple of minor kings of Persia that came right after Cyrus. Uh, but by the time that we uh, the temple is being rebuilt, it was King Darius, Darius the Great. And uh, Haggai mentions that it's the second year of uh, King Darius's rule, the exact month and the exact date of the prophecy. And this is super specific. And whenever you see this in the Old Testament, it's actually a sign of credibility. It's so that the prophet can tell the exact time and date on a reliable source for when this was happening. So rebuilding the temple was the most important thing uh, to happen to these Judeans, the Jews of the time, because their nation had been destroyed. And they have been returned. So for a very long time, probably since the Exodus and Moses, this was probably the most important thing that had happened to them. So in Psalm 98, we get a sense of their joy and their determination. All had been lost. Only a small remnant of the people had remained. But now they're back. And it must, been, it must have been an amazing time to be there because... Now they're back and ready to rebuild. A few weeks ago, I had a nice conversation with the, uh, the young man who is the bagpipe player that is using our, uh, our sanctuary as a, um, a place to, um, to practice his bagpipes. And I joked at the time uh, that, you know, you really wouldn't want a neighbor or somebody in the neighboring apartment playing bagpipes, would you? <laughs> so this this uh, this poor guy has to find a place to play his bagpipes. And um, he's a Greek Orthodox uh, person. And his uh, dad is a um, is a priest and his grandfather was a priest. And I'm really fascinated with the Orthodox Church. So I really uh, asked uh, a, a lot about, you know, what's it like for him? And he's also curious about uh, the Presbyterian Church. And we had a, a lot of fun connecting uh, in our conversation. We had lunch a couple weeks ago and really enjoyed uh, each other's company. He was surprised at how much I knew about the Orthodox Church. 
And that was one of those benefits of being, you know, a recent seminary graduate where we talked about it a lot. And one, uh, and we talked about how there is a tremendous interest in the Orthodox Church, uh, Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, Ukrainian Orthodox Church, any, any Orthodox Church, especially among young people today. There's actually quite a bit of buzz about it nowadays. Um, a lot of it we don't really sort of hear very much in our world, but among young evangelicals who have been sort of turned off by the megachurches that they have been to, many of them are finding new homes in highly liturgical churches. So churches like the Anglican Church, uh, the Roman Catholic Church, and really especially the Orthodox Church. And it seems like a complete departure when you think about it. I mean, a lot of these uh, people, uh, you know, were used to going into churches in undecorated uh, strip malls or warehouses with rock and roll bands and smoke machines and lights and everything. And, you know, and pastors who are really casual and coming out in their untucked shirts and and their, uh, you know, their jeans and talk and giving these really uh, life applying uh, sermons that are, you know, really relevant for today. And then they're moving from that world to this uh, other world of gorgeously painted interior sanctuaries where there are icons and saints and uh, paintings of Jesus and uh, Mary, mother of Jesus, and a cappella chanting for, for music with robes and hats and censers, you know, the things that you put incense in and you, and you wave around to give a, a smell in the, um, in, in the sanctuary. And high liturgy, very high liturgy, chanting, uh, these reading of these ancient words from more than a thousand years ago. What's happening? What is it that attracts them to this? Well, there's lots of reasons for this. And when somebody leaves uh, the evangelical or the mega church environment, they're not exactly the same, but there, there's a lot, you know, a good approximation of that. When they leave that, they become ex-evangelicals and they get take on the name sometimes called ex-evangelicals. And they can go in several directions. And frankly, most of them end up just leaving the faith. They've just had enough and they leave and they become non-affiliated. I mean, how many young people do we know like that in our own lives today that just don't want to do church anymore? Now, uh, yeah, uh, but some of them actually go to much more liturgical churches, like I mentioned, like Episcopalian, Catholic, Orthodox, and a smaller group actually are coming, going back to the roots of their parents and grandparents, and some of them are showing up in mainline churches. We haven't really seen that in our own church, but it is happening around. One of the reasons why we notice the decline in church attendance so much, uh, and we're so intimate with it in our own world, is because we've been affected by it the most. We in sort of the main line, the Presbyterian churches. Back in the 1950s and 1960s, churches like ours, Presbyterian uh, mainline church, had over 30% of the U.S. population in, in its membership. And uh, in the early 1990s, you saw a rise of the evangelical or these mega churches uh, so that they had over 30% in the early 1990s. But both churches have declined in membership quite a lot. Today, the mainline churches represent about 12% of the population and evangelical churches are about 22%. And the trend is the same. Uh, between the two. In fact, the evangelical churches, in some cases, are uh, shrinking a little bit faster nowadays, believe it or not. It looks like the, even, uh, the mainline churches like ours have kind of stabilized a little bit, and those evangelical churches continue to go down. And there's about a 20-year gap, so the trends are the same, about a 20-year gap. Uh, believe it or not, there's a lot more panic in evangelical world than there is in mainline world. Much of the overt political involvement that you've seen in churches are actually a sign of this panic. Uh, they're really signs of weakness in the movement. It may look like they're strong. It may look like they're big, 
but actually one way you can build up a church, at least temporarily, it's a little bit of fool's gold, but you can appeal to a political view, especially conservative political view in, in our world today. So the church as we know it is changing rapidly and we have to be prepared for that. So this is why I'm so fascinated about what John, uh, the bagpiper, says about the growth in his church. I'm going, well, what is it that's going on there? There is an earnestness in spiritual seeking about among many people today. As the world becomes more difficult to understand, uh, becomes more uh, impersonal, uh, there is a hunger out there for spiritual seeking. But what do we do about this? What, uh, one reason why is that highly commercialized megachurches just don't provide the community that people want. For other people, it doesn't provide the biblical depth and uh, intellectual depth that they crave. This is a big reason why about 20, 20 years ago, we saw a big movement toward these new Calvinist churches. You may have heard of some of them. Uh, this was, uh, the, the era was called the era of the young, restless, and reformed. And a lot of uh, people who were just tired of, um, uh, of lightweight prosperity gospel type churches or uh, whatever, uh, churches that weren't filling them, they ended up going to places like Mars Hill here in Seattle, which grew exponentially. Um, earlier versions of this are like Calvary Chapel. You may be familiar with Calvary Chapel, which is kind of this reformed, pretty conservative type churches. There's Great Grace Community in Southern California. There was Willow Creek in Chicago area. There was Bethlehem uh, Baptist. Uh, th these are the mega churches that really were very reformed, very uh, um, uh, theologically conservative. So I think we're kind, and, and a lot of that's a response to what they saw as the, the sort of the drift into liberalism or cultural drift that mainline churches like ours had, or that um, uh, uh, you know uh, other churches were just too lightweight. They were into po uh, prosperity gospel. So if you're a serious person and you really love the Bible, then what do you do? I think we're at a critical moment in, in really, in not only in the church, but in society. People are disoriented. People are depressed. People don't know what to believe anymore. We are just about to have an election in two days from when this uh, service happens. In two days, we're going to have an election. It's going to be divisive. No matter who wins, no matter what the results of this, you can be sure there are going to be a lot of angry people, a lot of depressed people, a lot of people who just feel like the country is going in the wrong direction. People are going to be wondering, are, have we lost the common purpose in America for our democracy? With the world so screwed up, so dispiriting, what do you do? So this is where our, the conversation I had with John really got interesting because the, one of the trends that he sees is he thinks that people turn to God when they're disillusioned. There's an opportunity here for uh, people to go to church. Now, while I'm a little bit skeptical of this because I haven't really seen that so much, there are certainly churches where people go to find an oasis of hope. This is why I think this ministry, our ministry in this place is so vital. It's a place that people can go. There's a huge need for perspective, for his, to understand a little bit about history, to understand uh, and reclaim the peace that you can find in a community like ours. In 2 Thessalonians, Paul says, as to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together in him, we beg you, brothers and sisters, do not be quickly shaken in mind or be alarmed, either by spirit or by word in our letter as through us, to the effect that the Lord of the day of the Lord is already here. 
So what Paul is saying is be patient. We, I understand times are tough. I understand it's very disorienting because Jesus, in their mind, the Thessalonians were very anxious about Jesus' return. They thought Jesus was going to return to them any moment. And they were giving up on their work. They were uh, giving up on society. They weren't even trying very hard to get along anymore. So when it didn't happen, they got worried. And they were depressed. And they were ready to throw it all away. Wow, doesn't that sound familiar? So when you're facing problems and hurts that you don't understand, when you see the way our society feels so fractious and difficult today, don't you feel that way too? Don't you just want to hit the escape button and leave? I know I do sometimes. So that's why when you come to worship on a Sunday morning in Edmonds, it's an act of defiance. It's you. What you're doing is you're defying nihilism. You're defying hopelessness. You're defying that polarization of the world that says we can't get along. You're making a statement and that you're taking a long view and you're having the perspective that regardless of what, of the pain and trouble in the world, that you find hope in Christ. Hope in the witness of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of God Almighty. This is why we are here. We are a bastion against hopelessness. We are building a new temple of hope. So when you think about the Israelites going back to Jerusalem and being commanded to make a new temple, as Zerubbabel was commanded to do, think about rebuilding the church. Why should we rebuild the church? God is commanding us to do that, to bring hope to our community. We recently changed our mission statement to make it something easier to understand and more powerful. What we're saying nowadays, and you can look at the front of your bulletin and you'll see it there. It says, we are a community where people stretch and grow in Christ. That's it. It's a very powerful statement of purpose that we be a community, that we invite people in, that we stretch, we and we grow in Christ. This week begins the stewardship season for our 2023 uh, year. And as you know, because of reduced membership, we've lost a lot of memberships in membership in the last couple of years because of people, you know, departing us, dying or leaving. And we've had increased costs due to inflation and cost of living increases. And now you have an installed pastor. And I'm sorry to say installed pastors do cost a little bit more to have in your church. And it's a big challenge to keep this church going. Now, there are lots of signs of hope. We, you know, we have uh, new members coming in. Uh, we do have uh, some people coming through. We have a sense of purpose. But what I really hope you do is that you prayerfully consider how you will support this ministry, this important ministry for Edmonds Presbyterian Church here with your pledge this month. Now, Carol and I will tithe for the first time this year. Uh, we, uh, we have ended our membership in our old church and our commitments to our old church, and we are now here with you. And as you know, I invest a lot of myself into the life of the church. I'm, I, I, it is my desire, and I am joyfully have become your installed pastor here. And you might ask, well, why? Why would I do that? Why would you do what you're doing? Well, I'm here because I see the pain. I see the nihilism. I see the hopelessness in people around us. I see people giving up on their faith, and I'm committed with you to create a safe place where they can rediscover God, where you can rediscover God when you feel hopeless, when you feel like 
Maybe you want to give up on your faith. There is a place here for committed Christians to look for intimate community. What an amazing thing. What an amazing gift that we have from God to be God's people in this place. Now, some people are finding new faith, and they're discovering hope in Jesus. Some people are so disgusted with the trends in society and the hurtfulness in a lot of churches, and they're just looking for a place they can be safe. They're looking for an oasis where they can go that with people that take the Bible and their faith seriously without judgment and fear. Some people aren't sure what they believe, and they're just curious about what they can learn. Think about how Edmonds Presbyterian Church is the kind of place where people can do that. I strongly feel that ministry is always a one-to-one -one thing. You need to know your pastor. Your pastor needs to know you, and you need to know each other in community. You should be nurtured in community. And I'm convinced that there are many, many people in our midst, in our neighborhood and in the surrounding cities here who want that, who want what we have. So let's make a place for them too. I ask you to do as much as you can to financially support this mission, this vital ministry, so that we can be this for you and for those around us. So please carefully consider what your pledge will be for 2023. Let us pray. Holy God of constant love, we live in truly frightening times. We're surrounded by disoriented, fearful, and dispirited people, people who've lost hope. Make us a beacon of hope for them and for ourselves when we have lost faith, when we feel hopeless. Let us be a place where we can re rediscover you. Make us a voice of defiance, a defiance against evil, against nihilism, against hopelessness, and against spiritual destruction. Bless this church. Bless us with new life, new hope, and the will to do your work in the world. We praise you and we glorify you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.